Recording's running. We're go. We're go. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good day. Bienvenidos to all and a most glorious welcome to you on this first of May, otherwise known as May Day. And also we acknowledge our friends over at, in Ireland with Beltane. But May Day has such a rich, rich history that how could we resist devoting a reading once again, as we did last year with our May Day exploration. But today, because it lands on May Day, how could we possibly, possibly not explore the myriad ways that that, that May Day, the first of May, has, has manifested itself throughout, really, the centuries. So today, on our open, our live open mic, you're joining us here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry for that very purpose, to hear the in incredible interpretations of our friends that are gathering from different places around around the world literally in our in our in our in our zoom room here today and welcome of course to those of you whom we know are watching us live on facebook as well I'm Sandy you know, and I'm your host for today, as I am most Sundays. Uh, glad to be with you on this 1st of May. And I, I want to thank those of you who I'd be very, very remiss if I didn't thank those of you who held a beautiful space for me last week, which was my birthday. And as I told folks in the room, um, a little earlier that Kim Ports Parsons, my dearest, dear friend, and he said, Sandy, go take a little break. Go take a little break on your birthday. Um, and so that's what I did. And um, there was a wonderful intimate gathering here. And thanks to Don for holding that space last week, an impromptu, uh, an impromptu gathering reading to keep, to keep things going. Well, on that note, because I know you all will define the theme of May Day, let me kind of let me let me turn let me turn the reading over to all of you, our dear readers for today. Well, our first reader, as uh, each of uh, each reader, as I've mentioned, will have up to five minutes to explore the theme of May Day. And I'm so looking forward to hear first today, we welcome Isaac Cohen, who will be followed by Josephine Loray. Thank you, Isaac. I'm so glad to have you with us and opening us, opening the reading today. Hey. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Don. <clears throat> I the coin. I feel love. I feel love. I replace to an uh, angel. You are love. You tend to mute. How marvelous is to see angel loves news. Thank you, Isaac Cohen, Israel. <laughs> there is there is no, there's nothing like opening with love. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing like opening with love. 
on this celebration here today. You're, that was Isaac Cohen. Isaac, do you have another poem for us? Uh, did you want? Uh, wait a minute. No. There's no pressure, of course. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Okay. Wait a minute. Folks, we are on the edge of our seats uh, here right for our May Day reading ah, uh, there yeah. to okay. hear another poem from wonderful Isaac Cohen. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Isaac. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The king no fight clean that the king non stop. Uh, okay. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, after, after. All righty, very good. Thank uh, you, thank I you. Find, uh, <laughs> I find a new. Uh, I, new I wanted to. I wanted to try to give you that full five. You know that full five minutes, and yes, it's all yes, right. Yes. It's all right. All is yes, well. Yes. And as I said, on this May Day, great way to begin the reading with a poem on the subject of love from Isaac Cohen. We move now to Josephine Lore will be followed by Giulio Magrini. Welcome, Josephine. Thank you. Happy it's, May Day. Happy May Day, and it's great to be here. I'm coming from Western Canada, um, lands that were traditionally inhabited and traversed by many different indigenous peoples. And I would like to acknowledge them and thank them for bringing language, culture, poetry to this land. Pikani, Siksika, Kainai, Nakoda, and Tsutsina. And I'd like to, I, a lot of my poetry is based in nature. And I wrote a piece last year about the work that nature does that maybe we don't really think about. So the first piece is called Tired as Travai. Travai is a French word, which means work. To hear the wind. And no, there are no answers. To see dragonfly in flight, singly or paired, double winged, blue, green, butterfly of orange and rust, rainforest born, another black winged, laced in white. To know that everything within this forest, this thousand shades of green and brown, is living. And when these plants lay down their lives, they nurture the next. They're always alive. Yellow jacket, mosquito, fly, mushroom frilling mossy stump. Lily pads, golden smudges on the blackness of the surface of the pond. This pond created by beaver, the tireless travail. To know the pond created by beaver and not sea beaver, to know the tireless travail of creation. And the next two poems that I'd like to share are both, um, they were born of prompts by um, European poets. So the first one is a prompt by Pablo Neruda, and the second one is a prompt by Pessoa, who is a Portuguese writer. Um, and so maybe it's a tribute to the work of creating poetry. 
So after Neruda, um, the lines that I chose from Neruda were, Escondeme en, tu, en tus brazos por esta noche sola, hide me in your arms. Hide me in your arms for the clawing hands of time. Still the pendulum, let the world spinning stop, your heartbeat keeping rhythm to our love. Eyes convey words that no human ear can hear. Fingertips trace unspoken promise unto flesh. The sun goes down and rises up again as we glide our way back to the ticking talk of time. And when I read Pessoa, it was the first time I had read one of his poems and it was very simple. It wasn't really seeped in imagery or any of the little tricks that we poets use. And it was about a stone. So that inspired me to write um, The Astonishing Reality of Things. Sometimes a stone is just a stone, ice on the water, just ice. Cracks on the ice as days grow longer and it slivers and it splinters, just cracks. And that branch, half submerged, half exposed, half in ice, half suspended in frozen air, just a branch. And the stone at the bottom of the pond where water does not freeze and fish do not die, just a stone. And the last piece I'd like to share is, um, it's based on a sonnet by a Canadian uh, poet laureate, George Eliot Clark. And I didn't, I didn't hold myself to iambic pentameter or the rhyming scheme, but I wrote it in the sense of eight verses of problem and six verses of solution. And it, the theme is certainty or the lack thereof. Sonnet number 22, after George Eliot Clark. I want the slow, sure collapse of certainty. Rain falling in the night, a crocus blooming on the bald face of a hill, books unopened, unread. I want the stumble, the pause, the downcast eye and singed brow. Ellipses of love, spaces never filled with wanting or with words. The ring on the countertop, journals to which the keys are lost, strings unstrummed, songs unsung, watches whose hands hide the look of shame. Oh, to never dance again to the sultry beat of time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Josephine. Uh, of course, always love when we're able to hear some of your work and how great to hear the poems of Neruda and Pessoa. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, everyone, as you know, I try to limit my, in the, between the open mics, I try to limit because I don't I limit my, my enthusiasm. I, I always wanna comment, but I need to move us along and, and keep my comments to a minimum today to push us along. Next, we will hear from Giulio Margrini and followed by Marcella Raymond. Thanks for being here. I'm so excited for your poems today. Thank you, Sandy. Overwhelmed with Josephine's work. My goodness. Uh, happy May Day, everybody. And buon cumpleanno e tante auguri to Sandy. Uh, coming to you from Pennsylvania today. My poem is titled, No, You Can't Write Poetry. If you carry initials after your name, you cannot write poetry. You must first figure out everyone's wokeness, achieving perfect symmetry in a setting of smug confusion. If you are wealthy, don't you dare write poetry. If you are poor, you can write it because you are powerless and no one listens. If you rhyme, you can write poetry, you will aggravate everyone, 
your words a self-fulfilling prophecy in harmonious contempt. Write poetry that is amorphous, incomprehensible, and perplexing. The vapid will be transfixed by you, and the scholarly will ignore you. Your attempt to occupy a gloomy or cheerful preoccupation in poetry are hopeless, pathetic. These harmful effects of your human creative waste are excreted on our environment by your uncontrollable anal creations. Don't waste your time. Poetry is not your thing. It is not meant for your type of person. And what are you doing? Listening to what you think is poetry. You live in dissonance with poetry. Plans should be made, subscriptions canceled for anthologies and meds, but you cannot write poetry. You do not belong with those others who do not belong, for they are the poets and live in the ether. They breathe the air of the misbegotten angels needing to fly in the polluted heavens, speaking the language of the dead and dying. But someone has to do it. And the person who was crucified this time cannot be you because you cannot write poetry. We have poets for that. <laughs> Don't we? <laughs> Am I allowed to have fun on May Day? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We do have poets for that. And many are in this room. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love it. <laughs> oh my gosh well to all the misbegotten angels out there keep writing your poems keep writing your poems thank you so much thank you so much well i'm i'm very excited to welcome marcella raymond to join us here on may day with all the beautiful guitars <laughs> and following Marcella will be Harvey Sauce. Thank you for joining us today. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Sandy. And it's um, just sweeter than you'll ever know <laughs> to be back here. <laughs> so I'm delighted. I have three um, short poems. The first poem is... Um, not necessarily about May, but about the slipperiness of time. Mm. And it's called The Time Before. Mm. In the time before, when fontanelles were still open, I moved easily between body and there, like moving between a small room and an endless wild garden. In the time before, we recognized each other by the pulsing signatures of our heart lights, the timber of waves and frequencies, the reach of rays. So much from the time before is gauzy memory now. Mm. Quick pictures that roll past just before sleep, like loose film reels left to spin, flap. I wake feeling the wrap of your thighs there. Were dark and light the same there? Was there a cat sleeping on a chiseled stone? Was I singing, holding you, you holding me? In this time of yellowed paper, fading pictures, dust, let us keep a toe in the doorway. Keep the way clear so that together we can make our way back there, home to the time before. Mm -hmm. Wow, beautiful. And this is kind of a May poem, I guess. <laughs> it, it, it has May, the word May in it. <laughs> um, Hummingbird Moth, after Ava Boland. On a late May afternoon, she appears, Himaris, Beehawk Moth, Snowberry Clearwing. She is here, not having come lazily along, 
but a sudden apparition. She is chimera, part heart melting hummingbird, her fan tail waggling, rolled tongue unfurled to dip into bee balm, million bells, flocks, and part nightmare, fringed antennae searching, yellow cape of fur, scaled wings nearly trans. to drop on themselves in silk, wait for spring. I am elbow deep in a thicket of tomato vines, knees clicking like cards on bike tires. When her hovering stirs a vibration along my spine. Like her, my season here is short. We will both beat our wings to exhaustion. And when too soon, Glorious adults emerge from torn cocoons. We will fall down, she and I, burrow beneath the leaf litter and sleep. And this last po uh, poem um, I, I'm dedicating to my mother who recently passed away. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is called, Even the Dog is Dying. Even the dog is dying and I'm failing this latest test of my be here now metal. I stare out the window at springs, green stubbled hills and wonder why something, anything can't be permanent. Or maybe this is the revelation in landfill plastics and diapers, hotels for post-humanity cockroaches. Beside me on the bed, the dog shudders in his sleep when I feel the tumor on his foot and wonder where. Spine, liver, spleen, the cancer has sent its invading armies. What soft tissue they occupy now, displacing, pillaging, subjugating his native cells. How can I be one with so much war? Across the room, my mother sleeps too. A generator's wheeze clank, spilling its useless oxygen into her, as if air alone is enough to keep us here. Thank you all. Thank you, Marcella. And uh, it's again, I, 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 I share with you in the memorial need to reflect on the loss of beloved, beloved parent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I want to also say, what a great idea for a future reading where we would choose a word like it may, when you said the poem has the word may in it, I was like, like, let's have a, let's have a reading where we choose a word and everyone has, poem has to have that word in the poem. <laughs> I think that's, okay, let's write that down, Kim. <laughs> well, thank you again, Marcella. Thank you so much. Next, we move to Harvey Sauce, who will be followed by Bill Nevins. Welcome, Harvey. Great Thank to have you. you with us. Today. A pleasure to be here. And Rumpelstiltskin is my word, so go with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is a poem that uh, essentially um, references May Day as uh, the entryway to spring and summer at Coney Island where those who are working uh, take their vacations. And this one is called Other People's Vacations. I collect from Pinterest photos of other people's vacations, which I pin to the cork board of my brain, substituting my face for theirs. A trick learned from Coney Island concessionaires who with a step right up and say ricotta please, 
invited us to poke our heads through cardboard figures on the boardwalk, to cosplay before our tripodal camera as Gandhi, Napoleon, or Genghis Khan, Aphrodite, that leggy proto-suffragette Wonder Woman, a haughty Marie Antoinette with her head still on. Our choice of notables out of history or legend paraded past us by these sideshow grifters and waving our dollars, we jumped at the chance. If only our English teachers and guidance counselors could see us now transported in time to a future perfect, greater even than that which our hometown Cassandra's every class has when a wallflower with a big mouth foretold for us in the margins of our high school yearbooks, Barker's emboldening each of us in turn to be a star at least until the next in line elbows us out of our avatar as might have been predicted had Priam's daughter accompanied us to the beach. Shape shifting without recourse to Weight Watchers before we're forced back into our daily cells, a half dozen or so cutouts for each gender to choose from, for little more than the price of a foot long. O oh, ye gods and goddesses, which character to choose enticing us with the persistency of the flu to cough up the last of our Nathan's money for the privilege of representing for one precious eye carrying moment on a gold drizzled day, something of the world's best or evilest. Goodbye fries with double hot dogs, kraut and mustard. Even now I can say it was money well spent. World's strongest man was the representational cutout of choice for our pair of 98 pound weaklings father and son and mother wishfully, your daddy is the world's strongest man, saying it runs in the family. A bold lie, I would repeat, with uncustomary bravado which show and tell, passing around a dog-eared photo of my old man, genetically enhanced by cardboard, posing on the boardwalk between cyclone and wonder wheel as his alter ego, after which, for a recess or two, schoolyard bullies would leave me alone, fearing Charles Atlas might indeed be my father, and that despite my 98 pounds soaking wet, I could be way stronger than I looked. Or perhaps the cutout figure was of a mermaid, and my mother, a bit skittish, having been encouraged to plump her head through, wore it well with a Mona Lisa smile that would have stumped even a smartphone, lacking only fishnets to complete her transformation. How Hans Christian Anderson would have worshipped her as my father did, and who could blame them? Creating a perfect storm on a teachable moment. Mama sleeps in our swimming pool. She goes there after she has put you to bed with stories and kisses, and this is why, as we have both told you, you mustn't jump into the deep end. Certainly not till you're older, so as not to disturb her or disarrange her bedding. Never, never jump into the deep end, which may be why duly cautioned, I could never do much more than wade in the ocean, mistrustful of the deep. I do, however, enjoy plasticky albums and slideshows of others deep sea crossing, places I would never go myself, places to which they have been trip advised, not quite agoraphobic. I can visit their dens or living rooms and endure their shameful boastings of, there I am with a lion, there I am, pal, aboard an elephant, or climbing Kilimanjaro, sightseeing at Shwedegon Pagoda in Yangon, Myanmar, Shan Palace in Zipor, rubbing the belly of the golden Mahamuni Buddha in Mandalay. I keep to myself that father once was the strongest man, not looking to embarrass those whose fathers weren't, I've been come round to my mother's way of thinking. And that mother in turn was a mermaid and that minnow by comparison, myrmidon to another's Achilles, I still cannot submerse myself in anything larger than a bathtub, one with clawed feet poised and their support. It seems all my friends are globe checkers of Homeric proportion, or at least have committed to memory and photo paper episodic globe checking intrepid travelers, deep sea divers, Iliad and Odyssey memorizers, 
mountaineers with selfies of self-acclimation. Through them, I can see myself in Kathmandu, uncontroverted hero of my own travelogue. Another's pith helmet becomes my pith helmet. There I am logging adventures, clicking lions from a Jeep, fearless as King David. And yes, that's me hauling my frozen ass up Kilimanjaro, determined to make it or die trying. More hands-on than Hemingway, younger by decades. No one, whether common boardwalk tough or Jim dandy featherweight, would dare kick sand in the face of my father's son, reputedly way stronger than he looks, heir to the genetic disposition, and I have the proofs to prove it, of the world's strongest man. I had another short one if I have time. If I don't, then that's fine too. Could you hear me, by the way? Or... I, I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank okay. you so much. Uh, yeah, I think we should. I think, thank you. Yeah, I think. That's fine. Can... That's fine. That's Beautiful. Fine. Wow. And uh, please look at the, please look at the chat. The comments in the chat, um, the world's strongest man. I think of so much about, it made me want to think that the word vacation might be a great word for, um, for our exploration word. Everybody has to have the word vacation in contrast to this idea of work. And also I'm really reminded, uh, so true to what you said that for, for decades and decades and decades and decades, time immemorial, Coney Island, particularly at the turn of the last century, was where the workers would go for their day, for their vacation and a respite from the, from the, the, the absolutely abject conditions that, that they were working in. And of course, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Harry Houdini and Bess Houdini um, were there uh, performing in those in the earliest days of Houdini's career on Coney Island. And Woody Allen supposedly was raised under the Ferris wheel. <laughs> under the, not the Ferris wheel, the uh, cyclone. Yeah, well, so. Coney Island would be a whole nother great Great exploration. Thank you so much, Harvey. And um, wow, what an epic poem. As, Thank you. As... I'm glad you enjoyed it because I, I rarely have the time to read it. So, you know. Well, next we will hear from our good friend, Bill Nevins. I was just talking about Albuquerque and then you popped into the room. Oh. So it was be it was it was beautiful to have that happen. After Bill will be Sandra Clevin. So take it away, Bill. And here's to you on May Day. Good to see you, Sandy. Um, yeah, here I am from Albuquerque, from New Mexico, where we have the biggest forest fire in the United States raging at the moment. Firewall. A brief parting from those dear is the worst we have to fear. So said uh, William Yates under Ben Bolden. Flames broke the ridge line just the other day. I would leap. I would skydive if I could. And now the winds were screaming so near to Beltai. We would run away, but we daren't leave. For this place is where we need to be. If any fallen sons or daughters, their parachutes reversed, are to raise their voices from stark caskets, urns and dust from the iron stars unsleeping rust to sing to you to sing to me if any dead hearts 
eat or burn if there be any new truth you might yet learn curious as is any mountain cat if any horseman his head in his hand his hand on his hat does not pass by this time but after all pauses to listen to speak to draw near to see what new revealing blaze might vault that silent smoking wall of fear well that's one of my lighter points um i think i'll do this Red bird, no nuke is tactical. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Tome Hill or Vinegar Hill. An incremental scale of sanctions, useless as Woodrow Wilson's rusty guns. Three stark crosses or the starry plow. Good Friday, hangover Saturday. May Day Sunday, or the Monday morning rising after <laughs> penitent brotherhoods, unchosen few, or Father Murphy's ragged troops waving blessed sides in vain against grape shot. As famous Seamus recalled, provosts may crouch in sullen shadow or curse the fallen church yet all climb to self-crucifixion. Martyrs tumble down. Is it less than a waste, blood or time? Mercenaries and coyanderas may gather dollars and herbs along their merry stroll down. Four cups of wine, 20 foaming pints, or Olympia with onions, carrots, and the medicines of the angels, crown royal, mota, patron, or pachin. Hoist your prayers and smoke. Glory to Ukraine. Don your red sash and dance. That unrattling snake still smiles. Allahumma, amin, mayday. 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 Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill Nevins. Appreciate always you attending to the theme, the theme. And today, everyone, we are celebrating and exploring, contemplating, reflecting upon the constellation of May Day. That was Bill Nevins and now we will hear our next interpretation from Sandra Clevin, welcome. Hello. Hi, everybody from Alaska, from me and Cynthia, who's reading next. Um, we have prepared as quickly as we can. My first poem is called Life Drawing, and it's about connections and divisions. Written for Aaron Carver, I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart, E.E. E. Cummings. Draw a thread to see the fine divide. The reach from here to there, a line divides, connects, accords, past to future, day to then. What do we know of lines and threads, of cutting and joining the loop and the coil? How lines and strands combine to weave reckless scribbles into a light coat for summer. How strings entwine, enclose, stitch up, lines draw a thing together to make perhaps a purse, a tarp, a stocking knit, a cap, a braid, 
the lace in the shoe he taught her to tie. Lines connect, surround and fold. Lines sweep a filigree arc, enclosing a circle of puddles and grace. To cradle, protect, encircle with lines, a child, a promise, a trust. Chords bind a father's hands, shaping a prayer, a plea, to end this luminous trial or best to take it in her place. A line from a song, his daughter is dreaming, beautiful dreamer, a promise, a wonder, a girl, drawn together, aligned. And then I'm going to read a longer one that um, is a joy to read. Um, and it, I, I'm not even sure about it. I'm calling it, it's the title is Dredging for Nichols. And you'll see how, <laughs> I don't want to explain it. And I really can't. Today, the river runs sluggish and dim, but it ever floats impossible fruit arising from deep orchards where water bees for silken seeds down the throats of drowned blossoms with names like limpet, rattler, Aswa, Zul, Periwinkle, Lugubrious, and Ringtone. Sex sparks and a fat bud bursts toward another kind of birth, and the teeming vines twine and the odd graft takes, and the churning work counts cadence in the cutter's brine beneath. Two, surface ripple signal, something new is washing up, something ragged and purple has beached against the headland. Turn it with your toe and it becomes a twisted child. Her hair is lank and dirty and her mouth is sing with berries. Her long eyes look past you toward the sea beyond the morning and her lips purse to shape a word, a name, a call. Then the night breaks its tooth and the cockeyed child is laughing and the circles in the water single craze, signal crazy to the raven as you scream at reckless heroes in the wrong place at the wrong time who have taken all your nickels and dimes. Three, charged coins fret along the staff of all that's holy and a plump bony pony breaks the stippled service gasping. She names the pony penchant and they trot along the beachhead, bare naked like Godiva in the wicked winds of Norway where sullen hills bear down to hush the jabber of the senses, and the girl twirls to music from a wind-up record player balanced on the palm of her hand. For today, the river runs rackish with rust. You scar the surface in a sailing rig, riddle the moon with rivets, speckle your wrists with seed. When your drowning is nearly done, the river cops up impossible fruit and you know you will make it when gleaners bring baskets of monkshood, manna, and hay. <laughs> Thank you. I love what Kim said in the chat, which was a feast of sounds, and I might add a harvest of sounds, well, I also love when poets come in tandem on the show and it's fabulous. And, and, and if we were to give a prize, if we were to give a prize, we would go to Sandra and Cynthia and, and, and uh, Leslie, you, all, you always come in a, a beautiful package together. <laughs> and we're very grateful to be able to hear next from Cynthia Steele, followed by Scott Norman Rosenthal. Great to see you, you, Cynthia. Thank you, Sandy. We are here in Alaska and at the Baskin Territory, just to recognize. And this is a fish tale. Don't reel, wait. Don't push, wait. Okay, now real. It's okay if he struggles a bit. Even let him jerk the line. Give a little. You need the strength when he comes. 
my new surgically altered hand, thinner than the other, technically one bone short, carpal, metacarpal, replaced by an unwitting arm tendon, refashioned for its new job, cushion between bones, seams healed, its scar carefully running between the veins of my lower thumb, whitish now, with the newly formed Frankenstein project hand, holding the pole, the real, the other, still in need of surgery, seems stable enough. I make concentric circles around the real, but only as directed by Paige. Her slight boyish figure tough as a young man swells my heart, pride of all women who take on men's vocations. I look to her as a mother might on a feisty daughter. She does not begin to grasp my pole. Her eyes exude confidence. She does not ask if I need help, she would know. This is an endurance, not a mayday call. She watched people time after time bring one in. No doubt, if I let go, when he pulls and strips a bit of line back out to the sea, then slacks and I reel, it will come to fruition. I'll bring it. I brought it with borrowed confidence, I'll say, with a new hand, with adrenaline surging through the still ill hand, removing memory, removing pain and embracing the new, the inveterate fisher, the culpable one responsible for the life. Now adrenaline takes attention, turns other people on the deck into muffled voices. Probably my husband's daughter, Sarah, asks if I'm okay. Probably his other daughter, Beth, asks, if I need her to take over. Probably my own daughter, Shania, calls out, you can do it, mom. But there are chattering cacophony of mouths, all moving, but no sound. So I stay on reeling. The process they say took about 20 minutes to bring in this fish, and I never dream his size. Just know he is possible, he is mine, as much as I know the likelihood that he will undo me and I'll fail is slightly in his favor. Another member of our crew, husband's coworker, Robert's 240 pound fish today, and how he had help from at least Beth and maybe others. Bringing him in was like capturing clowns in a circus, putting them in a cannon, flipping and rolling comically out his hope, hope slippery with slime, skin, strength, enough to get free, yet Robert's willingness to even let Paige help him certifies him with something I'm absent. The ability to allow anyone to take over my life, my great feats, my Moby Dick. I feel the slippage of line and my own skipper encouraged female team bringing in my own whale. Every once in a while doubt creeps in. I feel it's a chicken, it's a chicken, a tangled line. Someone's got my line. But the longer it went on with no one calling out, the more the evil hope, the dreaded three-headed hope, reared its head, possibility, fruition, satisfaction. And I know a few, some five minutes prior that it would be something. So the sun shone down, the daughters cheered on, the men weary, my own husband chumming seasick, but trying to appear excited and trying to photograph the big event. My pours ooze with gratitude for where I find myself on the deck of the sweet pea with Captain Matt and skip a page, writing or rather allowing nature to write my story of abundance, of loss, of the return of the three-headed hope. On this day in my 50s, when simplicity has returned and my confidence in life and my strength has returned and apparently the halibut have returned, so I bring the line not within inches, but all in for the captain and skipper to throw, pull, launch the massive fish into the boat against his wildest wishes. I'd sung fishy fishy in the sea, won't you come and bother me? My childhood song when I fished with my father before the bullet that chewed a hole into the back of his skull, before the time when things went bad for him, before my string of stepmothers, when he and Uncle Sal brought their two toe-headed kids along their boat, the Laura Jane, the one that got away from my father. And father wrapped his arms around me to give me his then confidence to tell me, you can do this girl, you can bring her in. And I with hope believed it so. 
Over and over, each time I fished with him, I believed. Yet over and over, we moved away from him until he was like a distant memory whose fading figure still encouraged me at the line when I reeled. The fish, certified enormous, if not the largest catch of the day, and female, it's a she, a gigantic she, hooked on a pole, slurfed up to the craft, gray bumps on one side, slippery smooth ivory on the other. The skipper hit her maybe some five times on the head because she was tripping people, her tail a hazard of slippage. I knelt upon my catch, forgetting hands, forgetting fathers for a moment. The begrudging giving of a life, bragging rights of an over 200 pound fish would be mine as we traveled to Homer, to Soldovia later in the week the story of endurance to be shared and reshared by myself and the crew, growing a bit heavier in the retelling. Sure, Roberts may have been bigger, but the statistic anomaly of bringing in over 200, two over 200 fish in one outing hadn't occurred in 10 years, which gave us all reason to hope. An 80 pound by my daughter, hope all around and perhaps the environment as well, healing, growth, evidence and science to back the enormity of wealth we all share. Good life, good fish, and those 20 minutes of incoming catch took me so far out to sea. There was nothing in my mind but the strength of one fish and the will to bring it in. It's, I'm amazed at how this particular theme of May Day is truly bringing out the epic stories, <laughs> the epic stories. Thank you so much, Cynthia Steele. I also, I couldn't help think about another poem of, oh. of, of <laughs> another poem as you were reading, which was Elizabeth Bishop's <laughs> The Fish. Yes. Thank you so very much. Well, next we move from Alaska all the way back across the, across, across, across the continent, across the continent. And to hear from Scott Norman Rosenthal. I wish you well on this May Day, my friend. I'm glad you're here with us today. Thank you. I'm going to start out. I recently kind of um, I'm reconciled to the existence of the uh, state of Israel, but I praise the divine. I'm not reconciled to governments abusing people. That's not the same thing. This is a death prayer, a Kaddish for Daniel Kiner and for Meyer Kahani, Jewish, racist, dead. Sleeping on grates and in doorways where the echo of the law falls and the rain goes. Poor people throw stones at soldiers. Boundaries of nations shatter. Go, dance with Hitler in hell or climb the fountain of eternity to the throne of Godhead. But go, leave us alone. Let us live. Uh, this one is um, a Passover hymn about the Nicaraguan revolution. There was a bunch of people who had visited that sovereign state and um, we were sitting around in a circle and then our consciousness is mingled if you believe in such uh, errant superstitious nonsense, which I do. And the next morning I came up with this to the tune Dury Air, an ancient tune. Up through the hills, the farms are burning. Down through the roads, the people, they do go. My sister here, a brother's heart yearning. We may find a way, we may rise and go on home. We'll be clouds passing through the morning. Clouds of stars will light us through our dreams. 
Still the winds, the seasons are turning. As we live, the people will go free. That's the short version because I'm going to sneak in something else. Um, as I and a number of pro professional people discuss, uh, some of them actually have like degrees and stuff, you know, MD, PhD, you know, stuff like that. Um, people with problems such as mine, we don't need a new group. You can put the, the word neurodiverse on the shelf or you, I don't care if you use it, but I ain't gonna use it today. This is the day for you, not labels, not divisions. Um, you know, I decided I was not going to let them kill me slowly and horribly if I had anything to do with it. And I was going to try to go out there and make sure they didn't do other good. So anyway, I realized certain things. This happened. Left off port side brawling, left off steamy siren dreaming. Shores rise through the morning's tide, a sailor comes home from the sea. Swells the road we run along, we'll be spinning wheels for speed before we reach the old front gate. Sure, a sailor's turned in from the sea. Tell of strange, tell of him, and tell of great monstrosity. Smiles and frowns round every word as a sailor winds through from the sea. There is this earth, these very hues, roads may come to thee. Our fair window send along, a sailor does hope from the sea. And that was for the Reverend Strain, and uh, I forget who else. Gotta look it up. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Norman Rosenthal. Just when I think, just, uh, you know, I can never anticipate what we will be hearing. And I think of like now the sea shanties and also, I think of a memorial to fishermen that that that's that that is stands in the harbor of Gloucester, Massachusetts. The fishermen at the wheel, with the saying, "They that go down to the ship, they that go down to the sea." in ships. It's a memorial that I've st stood in front of many, many times as it is the hometown of my beloved mother who is here with us today. Thank you so much. Well, we are continuing to explore the vastness of the theme of May Day. And now we move to poet. I always enjoy <laughs> whatever you bring to our stage, Joanne James. Thanks for being with us today, Joanne, and sharing. Thank you. This is just wonderful. It was really brilliant to be with everybody. This group is so important in my life, my poetry life. I'm a dreamer. So my, my idea about the uh, May Day or May is um, came from dreams. And my grandfather, who um, was from Ukraine, his family, I still have family there in the um, Chernobyl. It's a small, it's kind of a smaller city, southeast of Lviv. I keep thinking about my grandfather. I, I found some poems that these two just wanted me to read them. And my father, who I'm named after, Joe, Joe Warbick. It's uh, taken from a line from Dylan, mercy walked the plank. Shelter us mercy, we fall 
into disrepair, there is falling a tunnel, our cryptic blood vessels beneath our primitive skin. Have mercy our ancestors who crowd the sidewalks in the cities of our dreams. Dream mercy the rest is people talking to themselves, people with tears in their eyes, who sail the ocean, who take the planes and climb onto trains. Mercy, we thought that would never end. We would never say goodbye. Wondrous mercy that brought us Kmart blue light specials. We click on it, we just sense that we have named, we have been named mercy through wires, through wireless. With mercy, we will have our ashes carried out of here in those little white plastic Chinese takeout bags that say, have a nice day. And I'll read one more. And this one I just recently, I, I, did, I wrote it maybe a couple of years ago, but it's just been one I love right now. Angel, make me a body with beautiful clothes made of clouds. Make the burnt toast a spirit offering. Wherever I am fleeing, make me a body like a Louis Vuitton suitcase. My wrists and ankles, my blood vessels and inner ear can go in high style. Let me seize joy even when there is a cripple wing of stumble, a jealousy of tremble. I am no genius of letting go. I dig my heels deeper. My father said he was never going to die. Punk and liar, bramble heart, make me something sturdier, a body like oak trees, not fireflies. If I miss my chance, will there still be revolution speeding down the wilder roads or praying from rooftops? There's a basement in my heart and it's full of junk, a cheap carnival of chaos. Angel, make me a potion that'll give me wings. Thank you. If I miss my chance, will there still be revolution? That may be, for me, the line of the day. The line of the day. As I think about the, as I think about also the connections to union work, union labor, and the fight, the, the, the continued work toward justice for fair wages, just wages, and how many people have worked and revolution and 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 created revolutions to have this thing we call work be a safe, fair and just endeavor. That line, yes, it's gonna stick with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, can't, can't wait for the, the next time you're with us for whatever theme, I know whatever theme. And uh, also be sure to check out the visual art that Joanne uh, uh, posts from time to time. Appreciate you being here today. All right, everyone. We are to our final two readers for this afternoon. And I don't know how I did it, but I was able to conjure up Patrick Lodge for today. It's so <laughs> great to see you. Yeah, good to see you and everybody else. Fantastic day. Okay, so I think I, I can I can probably fit three three poems in. Um, hopefully, I, I said I didn't have any May themes, but actually they are May themes, so that's great. And the first one is called the May Crownings, and I have to explain. I, I grew up in a, a, a Catholic uh, community in the 1950s, 
in South Wales. And one of the big events was the May procession in which um, uh, school children uh, carried um, the May crown um, uh, to a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the altar. And I was chosen one year to carry the cushion with the crown on it. But at the same time, I was carrying the uh, polio virus. And this is my last memory, really, of um, those days before I had polio when I was sick. So this is called the May Crownings. Twice chosen was I that May Day morning, as we prepared to process, shoaling like holy minnows in the corrugated green space of the church hall. Six years old, tight buttoned into velvet and silk, a page boy hobbled in buckled patent, I stepped out towards consecration behind my blue Virgin Mary. Oshivorn, Philomena, Fianula, the fading schoolyard faces which stare up from the photograph now like evidence of a past atrocity, reject naming. But then, awkward and angular, in elbows and knees that needed growing into, the girls, sinless in their Sunday dresses, cardigans like damp folded wings, held tenderly before them baskets of spring flowers as if they had just alighted and would soon fly on. Innocent still before heaven, I thought the world was in that church waiting for me. A crown on a cushion, the color of a bruise, I carried it past stations of the cross and statues, calipered by canyons of parishioners. Salve Regina, they sang, Salve Regina. At the node of the aisle crossing, we paused. Priest and altar ahead, sunlight streaming through stained glass behind, coloring me purple. In me, an unwanted destiny, howling through my blood, coursing like hounds after hare, hungry for neuron, nerve. Marked by chance as elect in that congregation, no longer carrier, but victim in this place of God, where chance and choice were empty vessels. I raised the cushion straight arm achingly high, the mayflower and thorn crown and me, as one in the dark pooling at my feet, a gnomon, shadow casting into each footstep taken and left to take. And the second poem, um, of course, May Day. Today is International Workers' Day. And this poem was actually published first in the Morning Star, originally the Daily Worker, the Communist Party newspaper in, in the UK. And it was about a church I visited where the dissenters of the area were forced in the 19th century to attend services uh, in the Church of England by their Church of England landlord, or they would lose their job. And it's called the respectable working class. Week in, week out, I give my labour for next to nout. I've doffed my cap threadbare, tugged my forelock so fierce my hairline recedes from the back. I've seemed grateful for mistress's sawdust buns. The master's leaking roof above my head, where I wake each sun up practicing my yokel grin. Come Sunday, they want much more, want me to deny my own self. I draw the line at that. I, I'll go, sit in the pew, bide quiet, think, more pigs, less parsons. I pull the curtains across the window of my soul. I become opaque. They prate on about heaven's rewards while I think of Jenny, warm under the down. And afterwards buttered toast, scalding sugared tea, the smell of her on my skin. I hear the choir sing, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. Amen, I'll say, and look pious too. But mark this and mark it well. When the time of tribulation comes, the first will surely be last and well on their way to hell. 
And the last poem, um, which is a very short one, is called An Anniversary of Flight. And it, it seems to have nothing to do with May Day, but um, I wrote it for my wife, Jill, um, on her 55th birthday. And uh, unfortunately, she was taken into um, the hospital today, uh, May Day. It's called An Anniversary of Flight. 40 years on from the first birthday we shared, you let go of your heart, loose and light as a balloon, it flew up, would have been free, but I reached up, blind, caught it, held it tight, feeling still the tug of the taut line, the promise of airy uplift. Thanks everybody, thanks Sandy. Happy May Day to everybody. Happy May to everybody. Bye. Wonderful to hear, of course, from Patrick Lodge. Thank you. And I know you've got an event coming up as well soon uh, with the poetry of Dylan Thomas. So be on the lookout, friends. Post on Cultivating Voices about that. And folks, I know you'll love to attend that reading. Well, our final reading for today is from Don Krieger. And I'm very glad closing out our May Day readings with, I again, I know you've got poems on every significant theme. And I have no doubt that you will come through once again today on the theme of May Day. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. Patrick, I hope Jill is OK. If I understand what you said, that's actually. Uh, I can't believe it. You know, so many real things happening these days and every day. Anyway, these are, I, I want to read two poems about work. Um, as Patrick and others pointed out, it's International Labor Day. This one was, actually, this was translated into Farsi. It's appeared that way. Mm, yeah. Dream, Dream Street. I left her the house and got a place on Torley. Each night, the neighbors, put chairs on the sidewalk, turn the TV face out, drink Iron City, and watch the kids play in the street. I get home from work at six or 10 or two, shower and then sleep with eyes open. A child shrieking on a hospital gurney, her spine flayed and straightened, the smell of burning in my hair, a new mother life flighted from the mall, brain shifting in the scanner, crushed by bleeding while we watch. We drink coffee and wait while a father facing doom in our hands says goodbye to his children. Each day I pedal in over the Bloomfield Bridge or drive when called at night, never dreaming what will come next. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. Upward mobility. Summer nights, we heard shots down Larmer Avenue. One day, Bo, who barks at everyone, shat in the neighbor's yard again. When I got home from work, the neighbor rushed at me with a shovel. I bought a place across town by the city steps to the Alderdice ball field. You can hear the kids up the hill at night, all high up and laughing. I often hear our neighbor plinking away with a 22 at the hillside beneath their feet. When the kids piss in the parking lot and I ask, take it elsewhere, they come back, I'll kill you, kike. I thought about calling the cops, about the kids, and about the neighbor. Where I work, there's a loading dock in the basement, women in paper coveralls, busy, laughing, 
You can smell the morgue in the incinerator. When I walk through to the stairs in my office, I feel like a Jewish kid at the front of a 50s Florida bus, ashamed of my privilege and invisible. That's upward mobility. Thank, thank you so much, John. Again, I'm always, I'm always grateful when I see that you have added your name to the open mic list, because I know you're often respectful in not taking up the space. And of course, we are all the, the great beneficiaries and we get to hear your poems. And uh, as you'll see, Joanne said, those poems should be translated into all lang many languages, all languages. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Well, everyone, you have been joining us today here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for a, a quite, remarkable cavalcade of poetry on the, the, the much multifaceted exploration of the significance of May Day. We've discussed poetry as a labor of love. We began on the theme of love we talked, we had poetry about the labor of love. We also heard poetry about labor, the many, many facets of labor, as well as the sense of fertility that we find in the beauty of nature and how that is reflected on what many, many, many cultures is to have the May Day poles and rituals on this May Day, as well as marches all around the world, all around the world. Well, we heard today, as we're just as you're just seeing in our chat, if you're here with us in Zoom, I'd love to remind you all who we heard from on this most celebrated day and evening for some. We heard from Isaac Cohen, Josephine Lore, Julio Magrini. Marcella Raymond, Harvey Soss, Bill Nevins, Sandra Clevin, Cynthia Steele, Scott Norman Rosenthal, Joanne James, Patrick Lodge, and we closed with Don Krieger. Again, I'm so grateful for all of you joining us today for our exploration on the theme of May Day. I also want to thank- May we, may we cheer? Oh, of course we may cheer. Thank you, yes, thank you. Yes, thanks for prompting the Unmute cheer. and cheer. Well, Yay! Well, Yay! Woo Woo enthusiasm gets the best Woo! of me today. Fecundity, yes. Fecundity, yes. yes. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you, Kate. And thank you one and all for being those of you joining us here in our beautiful Zoom studio for our reading, as well as those of you okay. and paying attention mm -hmm. on Facebook. And as you heard, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming mm -hmm. to the next reading. <laughs> our next reading next week will be Sunday. May 8th, join us back here 
as we join in celebration of a much another celebrated Sunday. Many, many countries around the world, although not all celebrate Mother's Day on the second Sunday of May, but some countries that I'm aware that do, just, just for a little bit of information here, Finland, Denmark, Australia, Belgium, and of, of course here in the States where I'm sitting, we celebrate it as well. There's numerous countries. So come back next week and join in the footsteps as Marcella did this week, gave us a wonderful poem and tribute to her mom. Come and if you are able, bring your mom to the reading, read her a poem. I hope my mom will be here next week and I hope that all of you will be here next week. I thank you all again. I hope that you all have an incredible week where you bask in the fact that we've just we've just rounded out National Poetry Month, International Poetry Month. There's so, you know, so many celebrations of poetry in the month of April. But again, we turn the corner into May and we just keep the poetry going. We don't stop on a dime. So join us back here next week on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm grateful for each and every one of you for joining us. And I'm grateful for all the poetry you shared. And I'm grateful, of course, to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons for being the true anchors of, the, of this series, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. You see the graphics every week, the beautiful graphics. I love the graphic in particular for this reading uh, today that, that Kim, oh, Kim puts together for us. Everyone, you continue to bring your, as I said, labor of love of poetry to our stage and other stages around the world. And it does make a difference in our humanity. It truly, truly does. So as I share with you every week, please take very good care of yourself. Please take exceptional care of your beloveds. And we heard, you know, many of us are in caretaking, are in vigil, vigil modes, are, 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 are attending to our beloveds. And of course, throughout all of it, throughout all of it, continue to write your remarkable poetry. And of course, we're here to listen. Again, I hope to see you all next Sunday. All my best to you. Here's to May Day. Here's to Beltane. And here's to the workers of the world. And fertility of the land and the sea. See you next week, my friends. Be well.